Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Art and Friendship in Downtown NYC, a conversation with Deborah Cass, James Cottrell, and Joseph Lovett. My name is Leah Sweet, and I am the Head of Education and Programs at NYC Art Gallery. Some practical notes before we begin. This event is being recorded, and you have the option to turn on captioning. Please save your questions until the end and enter all questions into the Q&A box. And now I'll turn it over to Lynn Gumpert, Director of the Gray Art Gallery. Unmute, Lynn. Thanks, Deborah. You're welcome. So welcome, everybody. Um, happy to have you here with us virtually um, for a discussion between the four of us. Um, we're thrilled to uh, have all of you together, especially Jim, Joe, and Deborah, who is wearing a black shirt and glasses, even though it says her name is Joseph Lovett, it's indeed Deborah Cass. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I think it shows Joseph Lovett is that they're recording from computers within Jim and Joe's home. So can we have the first slide, please? I thought they were the same person. <laughs> 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 so we're starting off um, with some slides um, to get our conversation going. So the image that you see here is a commissioned portrait um, by Deborah Cass of Jim and Joe from 1993. And next slide, please. That was we nice. also have currently on view at the Gray Art Gallery, this uh, second portrait of Jim and Joe, this time by Adam Foos. And I want to make an introduction first to Jim and Joe. So Dr. James E. Cottrell is a past president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists and began his medical career at NYU um, before serving as the chairman of anesthesiology at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn for 40 years. He is currently a region at large for the University of the State of New York and has been, or was the editor, sorry, in chief of the Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology, and he helped fund the subspecialty. His current research is on memory and cognitive dysfunction after anesthesia and surgery for neonates and the elderly. Mr. Joseph Lovett is a Peabody award-winning documentary filmmaker who produced the first gay positive report for network television in 1977 on CBS. He also was uh, instrumental in a number of television investigations of government inaction during the AIDS epidemic at ABC's News at 2020. In 1989, he founded Loved Stories and Strategies, where he is focused on public health. Um, his latest film is Children of the Inquisition, Their Stories Can Now Be Told. And together they've been collecting art for over 40 years. So we have the next slide, please. This is uh, some shots taken from their website of their interior. Uh, as I mentioned, they've been collecting art or amassing art, I should say, um, for 40 years and it fills their Soho residence. So next slide, please. Now I'm pleased to introduce Deborah Cass, also known as Joseph Lovett in this context. A prominent American artist, Deborah Cass makes artworks which explore the intersection of pop culture, art history, and the construction of self. She employs a number of media from paintings and sculpture. And here on the screen, we have an iconic sculpture of hers, Oi Yo, as we see it in front of the Brooklyn Museum. She also creates mixed media works, including prints, photography, and neon installations. 
Deborah was the recipient of an important solo show at the Andy Warhol Museum in 2012, and her work is in the collection of many major museums, happily now also the NYU Art Collection. Kind of next. So this is one of the works in the NYU Art Collection now, thanks to Jim and Joe. Um, this is a work from 1986. Next. This is a work also in currently and NYU. And I think you can see another version of it behind Jim. You'll see it larger when we come fully on screen. And this was the study for the painting, which had recently had been on view at the Art Museum of the University of West Virginia, I think. And the next, a wonderful work called Parisian Gertrude Stein. So, and the next slide, please. So this is an installation view of our current exhibition, mostly new recent acquisitions, or sorry, selections from the NYU Art Collection, which is mostly recent acquisitions with some other works as well intermingled. And if you haven't seen the show yet, I encourage you to come down and see it. We're currently open from 12 to five during the weekdays, some Saturdays, check our website for hours. And the wall that we're seeing now includes a number of works, not all of them, but a number of works that were recently gifted to the Gray Art Gallery. And for those who don't know, we are very thrilled to have received a major transformational gift from Jim and Joe um, that we announced last year, at, which includes over some 200 works of art by downtown artists, and as well a named gallery and a named study center. So we remain immensely grateful to Jim and Joe and look forward to ongoing conversations with them about the downtown scene. Of course, the Gray Art Gallery has been integral to documenting and researching and presenting exhibitions that focus on it. So this evening, we are talking about not only the collection, but Jim and Joe's friendship with Deborah, also known as Deb, I think, um, and Debbie. Um, and want to talk about the collection through the lens of your friendship with artists. So I'm going to start it off with asking how the three of you met. Who wants to answer that? Joe definitely wants to answer that question. It's his favorite Joe. story. <laughs> Take it away. But I want to say one thing. That painting of Jim and Joe was a gift. Right, and it was for my 50th birthday. Correct. Yeah. That's and good I've to know. Done a portrait before, a, a Warhol portrait. So, oh, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that because I thought it was a gift and I was shocked to hear that we had paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were uh, we, had, we were very uh, close with um, Debbie's uh, former partner, uh, Diane Cleaver, who was a an editor and writer here in New York and literary uh, agent, literary agent, literary agent, and literary agent, esteemed literary agent. And Diane was coming out to the beach one weekend and she said, I've been seeing someone. Do you mind if we bring her? And we, of course, said, No, of course not. So in walked Deb uh, with her lovely dog, Jasper. And um, we had a lovely, uh, he was a uh, he was a dog that he looked sort of like a Portuguese water dog. And uh, he was a terrific little dog. And uh, we had a very large German shepherd, sweet German shepherd named Max, who Debbie felt was going to eat Jasper. And she uh, was very, she was a very worried dog owner all weekend. I was a new dog owner. He was not fixed. And my little monster was very aggressive. Right. He but, really was. And Diane was not seeing me. We were living together. I see. Okay. I have to remind you, Joe, boy. Well, she didn't tell us that. Oh, oh please. <laughs> Talk together. <laughs> this so, is how the whole hour is going to be, everyone. Just so, so the, you know. This so is going to be Hermione Gingold and Maurice <laughs> Chevalier. Oh, yes, I remember it well. So it was, 
So it was a it was a, a perfectly dreadful weekend, and um and I thought we don't have to see this woman again, and then then we found uh, then we found out that they were together, and um so we had to suck it up, and um and we grew to love Debbie a lot, and of course we always loved Jasper, and uh, she's been part of our lives for forty something years. I was going to ask you exactly, you know, approximately what date was that? 83, probably. Probably, yeah. 83, four, something like that. Not All only, right. Not only did we become friends, but we grew to love her work immensely. So, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about your collecting philosophy and your strategy? I know that you, you know, one of the signatures for me and one of the things that impressed me the most when I first, you know, as I knew you also for some 40 years, was that you did collect in depth with a number of artists. Well, at, at first I knew that there was art, but then I met Joe and I knew there was a story to art. So I learned that art could be beautiful, art could be political, art could be thick, art could be thin, could bring joy to some and, and not so much joy to others. So I learned a lot in those first 10 years about art and art artists. We not only became friends with Deborah, but we became friends with other artists who introduced us to other artists and also curators and museum directors. So we really got a good education in contemporary art, and we lived in the heart of contemporary art. Downtown so when, Manhattan. when did you move into your townhouse? Uh, we moved into this house in 83, but we had always lived in the village and Joe lived on Bleecker Street. And so we'd always, Joe came in, what year, Joe? 62. And I didn't come until 74. So, and then I, I, I started my career at NYU in 1974. And do you remember, Jim, what your first purchase was? Oh, I don't think you want to know. <laughs> All right. Your second purchase? <laughs> well, you know, we... What, we just, one of your early purchases that first, stand out. How about this? First one you're proud of. Oh, okay. I think it was probably the, the mother well that we got. We got a mother well and a Sam Francis. And we got some early David Hockney's, which were just wonderful. I think Martin. we got Roland Flexner. We got Roland before those guys. Right. And Roland Flexner was, well, we had a French art collection before we had our American art collection. And, but it was really, is bound to happen because the French art collection was mostly graffiti. And then graffiti came to Soho. So we didn't have to learn new, new language. It was already here. And so we could just apply the French graffiti artists to the New York graffiti artists. So that was, that was wonderful. So no, I think you're right. I mean, I know that when I first met you, you were very actively involved with French contemporary artists and traveling to France and buying them. Deborah, what was um, your first impression of Joe and Jim? <laughs> and um, I, I really don't remember my first impression because that I, Joe, that wasn't the first time we met. I'm yes, sure that was no. It really it, was. It was as, as you. We knew you as the waitress at the Broom Street Bar. With the sassy attitude, but we yeah. didn't. Um, but we didn't know you, liked you as the sassy waitress, but we didn't know you. No, that was the first weekend. Well, I I was completely freaked out that weekend because my dog was really aggressive. He had issues. He was found. I mean, he came this way, and he really could not stand male dogs, and he wasn't fixed yet or anything. So it, I was terrified. And, it's a challenging situation. Yeah, and, and this was a giant German Shepherd. I mean, my dog wasn't a little guy, but he was 30 pounds. He wasn't 75 pounds. So I was scared. So and Deborah, I, I, was... I don't remember. Um, I, I do remember that weekend, of course, because it was epic. But I, I don't remember when we started getting along. It must have been soon after, because we doubled a lot. We, we hung, you know, we were like, we were a foursome yeah. for uh, many years. So I guess we got over it, Joe. Very, very quickly. Very quickly. Right. And, we both, and we both love to fight. So that was always fun. We're both Aries. It's a problem. And, and I got the Hudson River drawing. So that made us even more connected. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's a good segue because Deborah, I was trying to remember the first time I came to your studio, which I know was definitely in the early eighties. I think it was around 1982 or 83. And it was definitely before I was with Diane. And I remember because you came with Marsha Tucker and um, I'm blanking, you know. The big yeah, Drifkin. Ned. And you guys made a huge impression on me. That's funny because I remembered going with Ned, but I didn't remember that Marsha was there as well. Well, maybe Marsha sent you because Marsha. I think Marsha sent us. Because Marsha came with Ed down. Probably. Before. So but these Marcia, were my days. Yeah, these were my days as at the new museum. Exactly. And I had started to do studio visits with artists. And you're, I remember the visit pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and I think you were painting rivers. Can you talk a little bit about your early, early work? Yeah, I was painting rocks and water and water and it was oceany and water pooly and nature, very uh, painterly paintings, which Jim's a sucker for. Right. So yeah. we have a great, a great that whole series. Um, and they were the first paintings I showed. So yeah, yeah they were land, they were landscape paintings. I mean, they were landscape paintings, but they were landscape paintings without uh, a horizon. So they were. It was a very active relationship with the viewer. Yeah. So I want to ask a question of you each individually, and I'll start with uh, with Deb. Um, what what was the downtown scene like when you lived in Tribeca in the early eighties? Well, we have to start in the 70s. You moved to New York in the 70s? Well, I was on the Whitney program in 72 and the Whitney program was on Dwayne Street. So what was it like? It was empty and the, I mean, except for artists. And um, it was in a bank building at the corner of Center and uh, Dwayne. It went through two chambers. And uh, the only restaurant was the Delphi. And we ate at Luna restaurant in um, Little Italy. Uh, but I came back to really live here after college. I mean, I was an undergrad then. And uh, I moved in 70, first four, I think, to Rivington Street. That didn't last long. Uh, but I really moved in. So yeah, I guess I moved in 74, lived on Walker Street. 75, 76 ish, I don't remember. And then 77, New Year's Eve of, when it became 77, New Year's Eve, 77, I moved into my loft on West Broadway. What it was like, it was empty, it was fabulous. It was, uh, Tribeca was not Tribeca yet and um, didn't have a name, I did. It was Washington Market or City Hall. And I lived on West Broadway, two doors from what was the Towers Cafeteria, which became, the Odeon, and um, it was kind of a busy neighborhood during the day and at five o'clock completely emptied out from all the, the radio guys on Warren Street, the city hall people, all the businesses emptied out at five and then it was just people you knew. It was artists and it was empty and it was wonderful. So Joe, you moved to the village first before moving to Soho and so, what was it like for you and when, when those early days in, in the village? I, I, moved, I moved to the village in 66. I was at Columbia and I had taken a year off uh, to go to the Sorbonne. I came back and moved downtown uh, to Bleecker and West 11th. And it was, um, uh, it was gay and um, gay, gay, gay. And um, many, uh, and a lot of, and many of the artists were gay and, and the and the people who weren't gay were artists, and uh, it was a, a very very exciting time, and um, there was West Beth opened sh shortly thereafter, and that was very uh, very exciting. Our, my friend Barton Benish um, had moved from his loft on 18th Street to West Beth to this wonderful studio, and to get to see. Um, artists housed in a place that they could afford and didn't have to worry about uh, uh, making their rent and everything 
that it was uh, doable to pursue their careers was, was, was really fantastic. It was really fantastic. I was a filmmaker and, um, and you know, very much appreciated you know, the, finan the financial struggle. But you know, one of the things that Jim said, I'd like to just pick up on, if you don't mind, Lynn, was uh, since we're talking about friendship, when he was talking about, you know, people would, in, you know, one person would introduce you to another. Artists were so generous uh, in support of their friends. And Debbie's a perfect example. Um, I mean, she always said, oh, you've got to see this person's work and you, you've got to meet so-and-so. And, -so, and you no, know, you would really love this one. You would really love that one. Um, and so many of our artist friends were that way. Um, our friend Roland Flexner, uh, who is in the, up in the show that you have on now, um, really took Jim's interest in art and just blew it up and just took him everywhere. And they would spend every Saturday uh, together going to galleries and, and Jim would visit him when he went home to Nice in the summers and learn more about the French scene. And it was, a, a re, it was really tutelage. And, uh, you know, the art collection is the Jim in spite of Joe collection. And because um, I was never interested in collecting period. You know, I mean, it's, it was just, um, uh, I'm cheap and he's not. So um, it was, uh, he, re he really just, he, he read voraciously and, and looked at everything that was going on and, um, and just, and just, you know, took it all in. So it was, it was with the help of, 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 of friends who, who passed, passed us around to, to all of their friends, which was wonderful. Now it's nice, these circles that can keep getting bigger and shifting a little yeah. bit, but keep increasing. Mm -hmm. So along those lines, Jim Howe, and since uh, Roland Flexner, who still has a studio, I think on, on Broadway and still making wonderful work. Spring Street. Spring Street. Um, how, how did you first meet Roland? Well, you know, I'm, I came to New York in 1974, the same as Deborah. And I had a small studio apartment on West 11th Street for $175 a month. So I was in pig heaven. I'd come from Pittsburgh. I was gay. And I came to New York City. And I had gay friends in New York City. So it was, it was all open to me. And then I joined the gym called Gold's Gym. And at that gym, I met Nathan Kalodner. In Sheridan Square. Sheridan Square. That's right. And, and, and he showed me, introduced me to David Hockney and all the abstract expressionists. And, and, and then later I met Roland. I think he didn't move to New York until 82 or 83, I think. This is when they came to New York. So then when I met Roland, he was so generous. He was unbelievable. And he would say, Jim, I'm going to go here this weekend and we'll see some early Keith Haring. Or Jim, I'm going to go here and we'll see some Dominic Figuerella. Or Jim, I'm going to go here and we'll see Philippe Mayo. So he really educated me to the art world in New York and also in Nice. And it was just, just a wonderful way to live in New York. Yeah, so I moved to New York in 78 um, and had my first job at the Jewish Museum um, and was living on the Upper West Side. New York was so very different then. Oh, yeah. And I do remember when I was still in graduate school at the University of Michigan coming to Soho to see some of the galleries and knowing that the artists lived there and being an art historian. The restaurant that I remember eating in was um, Jerry's. Finelli's. Oh, Finelli's, yeah. Finelli's and Jerry's were the two we, we went to. Yeah. And later when the new museum moved to Broadway, it was definitely Jerry's. Right. Um, Jerry's. So, later than Finelli's. Finelli's yeah. definitely yeah. later. Right. far in the neighborhood. Right. And actually, we met Roland through um, his, uh, Roland's wife is Sue Williams, not the painter, but the filmmaker. And um, she came to the States first before they were married and was introduced to me among different people that, you know, to meet, you know, to get a foothold in, in New York. And we became very good friends. And then when Roland came, we became friends as couples. And, um, and Sue and I would talk film and, and Roland and Jim would talk art. So. so 
Deborah mentioned that this was going to be nostalgic. I'm sorry, I can't help it. What What do you miss most about the downtown scene, or how has the downtown scene changed, either positively or negatively? Um, Joe, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, you know, I I think it's the price. One of it's access, access and the price point. Um, I really had no money. Uh, when I was living in New York in the uh, 60s and 70s, early 70s. And um, I had such a great life. I mean, it was so much fun. There was so many events you could go to for free or next to, next to free. Um, the theater was, the downtown theater was amazing. I mean, utterly amazing. You didn't even think about not being able to afford Broadway as what was available was so extraordinary. And, uh, you know, Charles Ludlam, uh, Charles Bush, I mean, just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. And, um, and, 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 and then the openness, the street, the street was just amazing. Everything happened in the street. And um, we showed, uh, I did a film called Gay Sex in the 70s. Um, and we, we showed it uh, a, a lot around. And um, we showed it at NYU a few years ago. And what was fascinating to me was that the students' reaction at that time was um, they were amazed. And we showed it at NYU a couple of times. But this first screening at NYU, the students were amazed that you could meet people on the street. They were so used to an online connection that the idea of just walking down the street and saying hello to somebody and uh, was totally foreign to them. And uh, I, I, I found that very, very sad because we, we lived in the nice weather. People were in the streets constantly and, you know, there wasn't a lot of work and uh, people had their bikes and um, were around socializing. It was just... It was fun. It was great fun. And Dad, what just, are your earlier memories? Of I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just listening to Joe, and he's really talking about gay men. So that is the story of gay men in the 70s. That is not the story of straight women or gay women, really different. So, so what is what are your memories? Well, we were young, so things were fun, and they were cheap. And the main difference is money. There's nothing like New York in the 70s when uh, Ford to New York dropped dead, you know, the recession, summer of Sam, the blackout, and being in your 20s and 30s, it was heavenly. But gay men met on the street and the subway and everywhere else, and that was their social life. That was not what the rest of us were really doing. Um, but it was cheap and it was fun but we were young and it was before AIDS and gay or straight in your twenties online or in a bar, you have a lot of sex with people you shouldn't and some you should, and it was fun. And the art scene was really different because for one thing in the seventies um, when it was the height of feminism the work you saw in the 70s in the very few galleries there were tended to be, or let's just say the best work you saw in the 70s was generally by women. And um, that's where the politics, the political excitement was and culture really follows politics. So people wanted to know what women were making in the 70s what women artists were doing in the 70s, there was a desire to see what women were producing. Of course, there was very little money involved in all this because it was before the art world of the 80s, which is still the art world we're living in, times a million. But the art world we, as we know it really started with Ronald Reagan and his election. The 70s was a completely different thing than the 80s right. in, in New York. And that's where money really changed Everything. When the tax burden really changed from rich people paying more of their taxes and the middle class paying less to the middle class paying a buttload more in the 80s because of Ronald Reagan and rich people paying suddenly a whole lot less 
they had a lot more discretionary income. And that affected the art market, the real estate market, New York downtown. You know, one, one thing I'm always amazed at is this whole idea of loft living actually didn't exist till we did it. Right. And it became a real estate, you know, phenomena and a whole, a, a whole there were apartments, there were houses, there was not a thing called lofts except artists. Now people love living in lofts, rich people particularly. So, you know, it's about money and it's what happened to the city and it's what happened to the culture and inequality and, and All sorts it, of things. a lot less of that then. Yeah, so I'll just mention, um, you said you were work, or I think it was Joe said he knew you as the sassy waitress at Broom Street Bar. I mean, at that point, yeah. everybody had a day job. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was a terrible waitress. And no, um, hmm? no you weren't. I, I, whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know, my ambition was always I was going to come to New York and become a famous waitress. I did it. <laughs> And, you know, so I was a Soho waitress when that was really fun to be. And, um, but, you know, I have to say before that, like when I was on the Whitney program, early seventies, when I would come to New York, bef even before the, that, uh, from Pittsburgh, from Carnegie Mellon, and I come with my boyfriend and his friends were living in Soho and they would turn their lights off at night because it wasn't legal. And there was one restaurant and it was, besides Finelli's, was, was just a bar. Um, the restaurant was uh, the locale uh, in the village. And then Spring Street opened, which was huge because it was chic and they had fabulous Marcel Breuer chairs, which everyone then went and bought. Uh, and then Broom Street opened, which was sort of the cowboy competitor to the chic Spring Street. And Soho really became, was started to become Soho. Then the galleries moved down. Um, Paul Cooper was there. OK, Harris was there. And then, you know, I mean, it, it all, it was just a, a, a different map, basically. But it's money that changed everything, but money changes everything. It still continues to do. Jim, what and is your biggest memory of moving to New York for the first time? Well, when I first moved to New York, I thought everybody was a, a robber, a rapist, and a murderer, because I worked at Bellevue in the emergency room. Oh dear! Every, every, every other night, and I saw all this, and I would come home to Joe and say, "Don't take the subway. Don't do this. Don't do that." And he says, "Are you crazy?" He says, "There's nothing out there to hurt you." So anyhow, that's what I remember how dangerous it was, but. I loved being in Soho in the 70s and the early 80s. I loved going out on the street and running into Leo Castelli. Tony Schifrazi was always up for a conversation. And sometimes you'd even see Keith Haring and John Michelle. And so I, th I just thought it was wonderful. I didn't have a lot of time to spend on the streets, but when I did, it was really worthwhile. You know, I wanna say it, it, it's, it's true. The neighborhood, it was a neighborhood. It was. And Tribeca was a neighborhood too. And, you know, my talk about running into people, I, Pearl Paint, if you went to Pearl, if you were an artist, you went to Pearl Paint on Canal Street, you always saw people, you know. Right. I mean, forget the bars and the restaurants, just Pearl Paint. Just, I remember walking to Pearl Paint and there was Elizabeth Murray on her way to Pearl Paint. And Elizabeth said, I love going to Pearl Paint. I get all my color ideas going <laughs> to Pearl Paint. And yeah. Alex, Alex Katz was on the streets even then in the 70s and 80s when I was there. Running. running. Yeah, running. He was always running. Still there. He's still there. He's 90 something. It was just a fantastic, it was a neighborhood. And it was a neighborhood filled with art and artists. Right. And right. art, the industry we built and right. fed. So I did not move, as I said, into, to New York until 78, but and was working uptown until 1980. So my experience downtown was more after the 80s, um, in the beginning of the 80s. But I know from working on the downtown show that Carla McCormick curated for us, what strikes me, and I think this is one difference, although there's aspects that are still the same, but the fact that there was such a diversity of work that was being done. I mean, it was not just one, we tend to think of art history as you know, abstract expressionism, pop art, so forth, but there were always artists working in different media. And I think the mixture at that point was very a healthy mixture of alternative spaces and galleries. 
Um, and so as Deb pointed out, you could see some amazing work being done by women at AIR and that we had some really landmark uh, shifts and ways of seeing and doing. And the first show that was up when I started at the new museum in 1980 was the Ree Morton um, retrospective. <laughs> so I do think people seemed a lot more open and it was a lot more casual. Um, the history of lofts themselves, as you point out, Deb, is fascinating. And we're very fortunate, I'll just throw out um, a, a shout in, shout out for um, Fales Library at NYU, which documents the downtown scene. And we have some of the, ver we have a lot of the documents about enacting the loft law, which made it legal for artists to live in lofts um, before you, and you have to have an AIR artist in residence sign below so that the firefighters would know if there was a problem, you know, that there were people living in the building because as you said, it was illegal. And I mean, there's been a lot written about how they evolved um, and there's some fascinating literature on that. Yeah. Um, where well, I, if you, I, I remember, um, a, a friend from graduate school at uh, the the film program at Columbia, who bought into the, the that first loft at is it four sixty four sixty two um, West Broadway, one above, of the, the Fluxus loft, yeah, yeah, and um and I thought, are you crazy? You know, it just seemed so scary to me and precarious financially, but they had a great deal of money and they they really could do anything they wanted. And um, they, of course, they bought it for nothing. And it um, wasn't a great deal of money, but it was, um, you know, the, there's a wonderful book by Rosalind Bernstein about 82 Wooster Street. It's the story mm -hmm. of the building and what happened over the years. Um, and that's a fascinating story. But certainly the fact that artists could live in these vacant industrial spaces totally changed and had an impact in a number of ways. Um, and it could make big work. <laughs> exactly. That changed things a lot. So Deborah, where are you living now? Oh, I've been in Brooklyn for almost 20 years and I've been in my studio in Brooklyn 21. So oh. it wasn't too, it's always about 20 years after I visited you. What year did you move to Brooklyn? Uh, 2002. And I assume it was rents or space? No, I own my loft. And I thought I should, I'd live there 25, from 25 to 50. And I really, first of all, I wanted to move to Brooklyn for a long time. That was number one. But number two was, I wanted to move once in my adult life. And my loft really was small. I didn't, I never had a giant loft. It was 1144 square feet. I slept in a Murphy bed because it was basically a studio. So, um, mm, you know, I really, it was time for a change. I it was really, time for, you needed a bigger space for many and, reasons. It, it wasn't about the space that changed for very, in various boring ways. I, I won't, it's too boring to talk about, but, um, no, I was already in my studio in Brooklyn. Um, I just really, uh, really needed to live somewhere else. I was on fourth floor, walk up with a bad knee and um, from carrying Jasper up in his old age, really, <laughs> he was 19 and I- was We're back to Jasper. Hmm? We're back to Jasper. We're always back to Jasper. But uh, anyway, I, I really, I blew out my knee and I, I but it, it wasn't that. I really, really 25 to 50, like, I need to live somewhere else besides 137 West Broadway in my life. And I, I moved to Brooklyn for the lifestyle. I mean, I have a beautiful house and I already had had a great big, you know, I already, my studio in Brooklyn's bigger than my, where I lived and worked on West Broadway most of my life. Wow. But I've now been there more, but it's not like a giant studio either. It's just, I wanted rooms. I want to live in a house like Jim and Joe's. That was like a big thing. I was like, can I live like Jim and Joe? And can I live like Pat and Yost? So <laughs> we have a really nice house. And I already had my nice studio in Brooklyn. So it, it's only a mile apart. It, it was, I really needed a change. 
Yeah, I mean, I think Jim and Joe, you guys are happy where you are. It's a really ideal situation. Yeah, but what when we bought nobody, you know, nobody wanted to be here, and um, you know, the house had been in the market for three years, and the agent said, "Name your price." You know, they're desperate to sell it. So you know, and it's a great house, though. It was the it was can the printing, it's the old printing neighborhood at that time. And so it was noisy and the presses were clanging all the time and there was uh, uh, ink in the air and it smelled. Yeah, this is the printing neighborhood. Right. But we could afford it. So um, it was within our budget. And so we bought it. And it's then, funny because Joe, because mine was the shoe neighborhood. <laughs> like my building was shoe manufacturing mm -hmm. and all, all the buildings near and not all, but a lot of the buildings that really was the shoe shoe manufacturing district and slightly south was the electronics like south of chambers right all these neighborhoods really had everything's changed yeah i mean and washington yeah. market just to the west of me was eggs and cheese and butter that was it yeah yeah and i was my uh, loft which i purchased with my ex-husband in the mid 80s was um fur factory we were up in uh chelsea on 26 yeah. oh yeah the seventh yeah so well, I could see the potential for our garden in the backyard. That's why I wanted the house. Well, that makes total sense because having an outdoor space in New York City is, is Amazing. Yeah. pretty spectacular. And I definitely yeah. wanted one like Jim and Joe. And <laughs> so I want, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, when you see it, it, it leads to. So I'll, the last question is, you know, we mentioned some of the spots that you guys hung out at as a foursome. Are there any other locales where people would convene besides Pearl Paint and oh, locale? Of course. I mean, every neighborhood had its places. I mean, Towers Cafeteria, which became the Odeon. So first in the morning for 59 or 69 cents, you'd have breakfast. And then I, I knew Keith McNally when he was the maitre d' at one fifth because he was dating a friend of mine. So Keith and Brian bought the space or I don't know, rented it, I don't remember, but they took towers and that was Joan Panzer and Artie Panzer's place. Then Keith and Brian and Lynn took over and did the Odeon, so there was the Odeon. But in Tribeca, I mean, when I started living there before it was Tribeca, there was- um, Mamas. No, I'm blanking on the name on Bubbies. Queen Street that I absolutely Bubbies. adore. It was Bubbies. a tiny little bar, uh, uh, Barnabas, Barnabas Rex. Wow. That was the place in the 70s. Then later there was Puffy's and Bubby's and, you know. Does anybody remember Sutter's? No, where was that, Jim? It's in the village. Grand 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 Grand. It was no, the we went up to the village. That was uptown. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all got nosebleeds if we went above 14th Street. We yeah. did. Yeah. Well, we had so to. I want to encourage our listeners to start putting some questions if you have any in the Q&A function, because um, it would be interesting to be able to answer or respond to um, any questions or um, thoughts that you all have listening on the other end. Um, now in terms, it's interesting to see um, in today's downtown scene that galleries are still moving around. Um, there's a number now in Tribeca. There are of course a number now still in the East Coast returning to the East Village. I mean, that was a big thing during the eighties was the, the rise and the decline of the East Village art scene. Um, and that was a whole different kind of scene. And now they're moving back to NoHo um, and not too far from the Gray Art Gallery. There are a number of really interesting galleries. Are there any, and in Brooklyn, there are so many different spaces. Um, are there any spaces that you guys all enjoy going to in particular to see, to see work? I love going back to Tribeca. I love seeing work in Tribeca. It is so much friendlier than Chelsea. The vibe is so much nicer. I mean, that's why I like living there. The, the sky was bigger, um, but it's just such a nice vibe. And I just love going back. You know, I love that this is happening in Tribeca to the point that I thought maybe I should buy back my old loft for a minute. Uh -huh. And I actually had a conversation with the guy that bought it from me 17 years ago, 18 years ago. And I was like, 
thinking maybe I should move back. It looks like so much fun now. So I really, I love going in, in Tribeca. I think it's great. I love it's the Upper East Side. What? You like going to the Upper East Side. Yes, it is nice. It's refreshing sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I was at, it's, it's funny, Debbie would mention the friendliness of downtown. I was at the David Werner Gallery in Chelsea the other day with some friends from out of town. They have a, some great shows up. And I was just shocked at how friendly the front staff was. It was so non-Chelsea. They were so nice and so outgoing and so I, I actually, Joe, I didn't mean the people. I just meant the architecture. Oh. <laughs> Apropos both of no, these but, neighborhoods, both neighborhoods. I mean, it's it's just sort of an architecture response. It's, it wasn't about the people. It's the same yeah. people. They're gallery people. It's it's and just no, about the architecture. But we got a private off tour of David Lieber of the Diane Arbus show. Where do you get that with the principal of a gallery? Fantastic. There Times are tough, a, Jim. What? Times are tough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that is. So like the recession. So oh. we've, we've gotten a couple of comments. One, just so that everybody knows, Shutters was at Greenwich and 10th Street. Um, so we located yeah. that back in the village. And there's also a question about um, the Leslie Lohman Museum and the space and when that opened and it, do we have any connection to it, any of us? Well, it wasn't really a place for lesbian artists. Until for a long time. For a very, I mean, they're, they're trying, but it was a particularly uninteresting place for lesbians. And it was a very interesting place for gay men. Joe, James, Jim, any comments? Did you did you see exhibitions there? No. Yeah, we. I saw uh, Queer Threads uh, a few years ago, which I thought was an amazing exhibit. And that's traveled around a, a good deal, but I think it created quite a splash. And um, uh, a friend of ours and artist that we collect, Rebecca Levy, um, had some wonderful pieces in it, and uh, that was that was great fun. Well, they're changing uh, their programming a lot now. They're they're yeah. really working on it. Yeah. Oh no. And there have really been some wonderful great. shows of some lesbian oh, yeah. artists. Oh, yeah. Since. Yeah. Yes. I mean, our first, the Gray Art Gallery's first connection was during, I mean, the first time we collaborated was during the Stonewall show. Um, and uh, we were approached about taking the show that Columbus Art Museum had, had I guess, approached, approached the Leslie Lohman Gallery first. But of course, we said, yeah, I mean, the Stonewall was, of course, a very important period. Um, our important place, speaking about places again, where people hung out and that the Stonewall riots were essential to um, so many aspects of right. life in New York City. And it's not that far from the Gray Art Gallery. So that was a wonderful show. And that's when we also, it was during that, that we screened some of um, Joe's very early um, important films that he made about AIDS and about the gay community. Mm. You know, um, we should mention that um, there's a, a really nice profile of, uh, of, of Debbie and one of uh, her wife, Patty Cronin, um, that I did, uh, that I think it's up on our website, right, Jim? Yes. We viewed there. It's on, and our, it's on a, our website, the CottrellLovettCollection.com. And, so if everybody um, got that, Coach Trail, love it. And um, a nice feature on Deb and her wife, Patty Cronin. There's four and then it, it, was, it was really fun, you know, doing profiles on each of them. And, um, you know, because we know each other so well. And, um, and it, 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 I think they, they turned out great. But then uh, when Deb was getting her Oyo finished for Brooklyn, um, it was first in, in the, the park there. Um, we said, well, why don't we, why don't we shoot it for you? And our young crew went over and, and shot. And that was a lot of fun. Really a lot of fun. That. And, oh, yeah. And, yeah. That was and great. You know, that comes from art and friendship, you know. So we have, um, and this is kind of a good question. I think we're getting close to um, wrapping up. Um, but 
a question for Jim and Joe. What does your art collection mean to you? Pleasure when I come home. Pleasure. What? Yes. So just pleasure and I would think stimulus and... Um, you walk in and you see these wonderful works of arts and you can think about each one or you can look at the whole of them. You can think, now what was I thinking when I bought that? And you can go back and count <laughs> them. And it's always pleasurable. So it's just wonderful to have. So just I've deriving been. joy from being around wonderful artworks. Right. And that's it. one of the only reasons to collect, isn't it? <laughs> well, Joe? To collect for different well, I've, I've never been interested in, collect, quote, collecting art, and I've always been, a, you know, found the art, the concept of the art of collecting is sort of disgusting, and I've, I've never really understood why Jim wanted to own so much, and, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, but we're having a show of um, a good part of the collection at the Orlando Museum of Art in a number of years. And it was called um, uh, The Artist and the Collector. And um, and Jim went down to hang it with Sue Scott, who was their curator at the time. And I went down and it was the first time anyone had ever seen all the work together. And you know, when you go into a show that's really exciting. And I, I think that the Basquiat show at the Whitney years ago, was like that, uh, where all the pieces talk to one another and the people talk to the pieces and the pieces talk to the people and the people talk to the people and there's this incredible energy. And it was that kind of a show. And I had a whole new regard for Jim and, and his passion for collecting. And because there, there was a, he created conversations um, among the pieces that I had never quite understood. And it was when, when it's all together, you really understand, you know, it's reason for being. And um, I, I think it's, you know, he may say it's just as for his personal pleasure, but I think he's really put together an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary conversation. And um, and uh, I, I think I think it's it's really great. No, I think it's wonderful, and we're planning on having lots of more conversations <laughs> between works as we acquire the collection. I All right, forgot for to mention that if you don't buy art, the artist doesn't eat. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so it's important. So part of, the, part of it is knowing you're helping continue and, and support the yeah. artistic Courage community. Artists. Yeah. All right, so we have one other question um, and it's about uh, in two parts. Um, and I'm gonna ask the second part first. Um, it's about Jim and Joe, your decision to make this transformative gift to the gray, and Deborah about your philanthropic work at the Warhol Foundation. Do you want, uh, and your role on the foundation, the Warhol Foundation board. So do you wanna just say a few words about that? Well, I actually just rotated off after eight years and it was just at my last wow. meeting on Friday. Very but topical. It, very. But um, it really was just one of the greatest things I've been able to be part of to give, you know, to be, it's a privilege to be able to give back. It's a privilege. And I felt so privileged and so honored. And it was such a high level. Uh, we met four times a year. I mean, they, we meet five to four times a year and, and fund, uh, you know, major shows in major museums, but also have really established a uh, skeletal, well, not skeletal, but uh, 32 cities, smaller cities, arts organizations get money that can then go directly to artists in a re -grant, in regranting programs. And it, it really has put together a skeleton of arts, art support that is not in major cities that aren't the Whitney or Cincinnati Museum or you know in smaller cities for small arts organizations and for artists who really can't afford to be in LA or New York anymore. So really did crucial work during um, COVID 
and also in my time there, eight years, the nature of the grants and the demographic of the grants was diversified extraordinarily from when I got there and in a couple of years in, we started to really work on the, I mean, it, it, when I got there, it was almost like all white men got support for major shows. And really within a couple of years, things really started to change. And now not only are the grants uh, go to incredibly uh, diverse projects by div diverse artists, but the board itself has become uh, fantastically, so it's such a strong board with such fan great people. I wish I was gonna be there because I was on the nominating committee and three new people are, three of us left and three new people are on and there is just fantastic. Well, so it's great to have this. I think it's the biggest um, funder of the visual arts in the country. Really? It's been extraordinary, you know, and been able to really support a lot of work. And it's interesting to see how it's evolved and grown and, really and changed has. over the times. It really has in the last eight years evolved. And so the first part of the question was um, to Joe and Jim as to why they decided to make this um, transformational gift to the gray, besides the fact that I'm so charming. But um, <laughs> what were the other reasons yeah. behind it's you. It's, we were just talking about this today. Uh, Doreen Carvajal, who used to um, uh, write on no, it's the NYU. Times, yeah, and um, and and you know, and she said, you know, why, you know, what caused you to do this? And we said, well, we've known Lynn for a, a long time, and she came in one day and and she said, I've an I've an idea, a proposal for you, and it just made a lot of sense because um, uh, Jim has always wanted to keep the work together as much as possible. And, um, you know, we very much admired what you've always done at the Gray and elsewhere. And um, to be able to have a downtown where we live and in a university environment, the study center made sense. And it just made a lot of sense, right, Jim? Yeah, I think we wanted somebody who would take as good a care of it as we did or do. And I think Lynn and the Gray will do that. And we walk by there every day. It's where we live, it's our home. So why not you know, make that more of our home after we're gone? And I will say that, you know, um, Jimmy might not remember this, but at one of the meetings that we had in my office, um, we were talking, you mentioned, this was around Stonewall, that you were looking for, to, for proposals from universities to take on the collection. And that's mm -hmm. what spurred me to think, well, gee, if I were to make a demand, what would be top on my list? And it's always been my dream to have a study center to give you know students direct access to works of art more than we can do now, which we've, we've done in the past, but now we'll have also a center that will look at and continue to document and research downtown art. Um, which has been, you know, again, so central to our programming and to what we aspire to do. And NYU being a member of the lower Manhattan cultural landscape, you know, it does make sense on so many, so many ways. So yeah, I want to well, thank you all. Yeah. Joe, I just want to say, yes, I, I want to say, and your offer to, uh, to do um, uh, a Jim and Joe statue out of our, our out of our funeral ashes uh, to place in front was a that was the that was the big thing. That was, that was the really that's what nice. clinched the deal. I'm yeah, sure. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you know we all derive so much joy from art. Sometimes it's provocative and makes us think, but um, friendship and humor and um, all that makes it so much more alive. So again, thank you all for participating. And I want to remind everybody to come to see Mostly New, where you'll see the works by Deborah Cass that we have on view currently, along with a wonderful selection of other works that were in the first batch of works that we've received. We're working on the second batch now, so that too will continue to evolve. Sure. So thanks to everybody. And um, Leah, do you have anything you want to add? Thank you for everything. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, very much.
Oh, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. It was a delight to hear. And uh, if you're interested in more programming from the Gray Art Gallery, please visit us at our website, uh, grayartgallery at nyu.edu. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.